I call this meeting of the Conroe Independent School District Board of Trustees to order that the record show that a quorum of members is present, that this meeting has duly been called, and a notice of the meeting has been posted in accordance with the Texas Open Meetings Act, Texas Government Code Chapter 551. The time is 6.05. Please join us and Mr. Datron Williams in our invocation and Pledge of Allegiance. If you're so inclined, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that you continue to bless this school district and every home represented here. Despite the many challenges of this year, we come before you in a spirit of thanks during this holiday season. Thank you for bringing us through this year and thanking you in advance for the blessings of the next year. We pray that our children and staff have a safe and happy holiday break. Now, Father, as we start this meeting and as our country begins with new leadership, let us decrease and allow you to increase in us. Grant us a continuous bounty of wisdom and grace in our discussions, decisions, and interactions with one another. In closing, please forgive us for our sins so that our prayers may not be hindered. We thank you, Father. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Under the Texas flag, I pledge allegiance to the state, Texas, one state under God, one and indivisible. Thank you, Mr. Williams, and for everybody's participation. I'd like to move on to item 2. A, I'm sorry, item 2B, Special Board Recognition, Construction Trade and Teacher Career and Technology Education Program. All right. No. Thank you, President Hubert. As uh, we were going to pull item 2A tonight, we'll, we'll uh, move that item to next month. But as we move to item 2B, um, you know, we could not have had such a successful school year without heroic efforts throughout the school district. And uh, our plan in the coming months is going to be to bring uh, before you different groups and highlight the work that they did that has helped us to not only open school but keep school open uh, and tonight we're proud to start with our career and technical education teachers who uh, you'll hear the story tonight but uh, not only did they save the district a lot of money but their efforts made our school safer uh, and they gave us that opportunity to open on time and not be waiting uh, on vendors so here tonight to make that special introduction uh, is Mr. Chris McCord, our Executive Director of Operations. President Hubert, members of the board, and Dr. Knoll, tonight I'm here to recognize three of our district career and technical education instructors for their outstanding work to help provide for the safety of our employees and students. During the summer and early fall, Dennis Hom of Oak Ridge High School Ignacio Saceda of Caney Creek High and Mike Brown of Conroe High School volunteered to manufacture our own CISD created Steez Guard desk shields. Their efforts came at a critical time as we planned for a safe opening. When shields of this type were difficult to obtain from vendors in retail for approximately $130 per stand. Through the efforts of these three individuals and CISD purchasing, we were able to obtain material to create 800 additional plexiglass sneeze guard desk shields for $15.50 per device, saving the district $91,600. Additionally, I would like to recognize Mr. Greg Shipp, Conroe ISD Director of Career and Technical Education, for instantly volunteering, designing the prototype, and taking the lead on this pivotal project. I present these outstanding individuals for recognition tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. On behalf of the board, uh, I think I believe the other two gentlemen couldn't be here tonight, Mr. Saucedo, um, if you would accept this recognition on behalf of, of your other colleagues as well and, and Mr. Shipp. You know, in CISD, we proudly proclaim all means all. 
And CTE is such a vital part of that, the education that you provide for our students. Um, but you three gentlemen, um, under the, the guidance of Mr. Ship, you exemplified all means all. You didn't, you saw a problem and you didn't sit back and say that's maintenance's problem, that's procurement's problem, um, that's purchasing's problem. You stepped forward and said, I have a skill set to offer the district um, and, and I'm gonna do my part. Um, and, and what we heard tonight, um, I, I couldn't have said it better myself, you, you contributed, you know, you didn't just save the district money, you made our schools safer for our staff and for our students. Um, and from the bottom of all of our hearts, we want to thank you for stepping above and beyond what's written down on that job description that you signed when you, you came to work for us. But, but um, believing in this district and believing in these students and believing in your coworkers and making life better for all of us. So from the entire board, thank you very much. And thank you to Mr. Schiff for your guidance. Thank you. I just, if, for just two seconds, what, what I'd like to say, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Noel, uh, Mr. President, board members, these three teachers exemplify all that is good in education and they exemplify all that is good in Conroe ISD. When Mr. McCord approached us this summer, I said, absolutely, let's go. I actually took um, one of the shields that Mr. McCord gave me, sketched it out. I took a picture and I faxed it to Mr. Salcedo, who was out of state on vacation <laughs> and called me back and said, Mr. Ship, we can absolutely do this. Under the leadership of, of Mr. Hom, Mr. Salceda, and Mr. Brown, they went to work on behalf of this district. And I, I must tell you, that's one of the reasons, one of the many reasons I love this school district. Mr. Salceda and his wife, Michelle, are both part of the career and technical education team. We're so fortunate to have them on our team. All three of the teachers who participated in this process came to us from industry. They have industry experience. They are focused on getting our students ready for both post-secondary ed education and the world of work. And I humbly thank you, Mr. Salceda. And Mr. Uh, Hum will be here a little bit later. Mr. Brown couldn't be here, but what a pleasure it was to be of service to our district. Thank you, Dr. Noll. Yes. Well, Mr. Ship, I don't want you to escape here. I'd like to have you come back. We don't get to do this very often in board meetings. These things uh, often happen, um, you know, in a ceremony quietly here in the admin building or in ceremonies uh, on campus level. But uh, tonight we're going to get to celebrate a retirement. Uh, and while we're super sad to, that Mr. Ship is retiring and leaving, you, you've seen tonight an example of his leadership. You know, you don't have um, people that want to work as hard as, as these three teachers that were recognized tonight want to work unless they're working for somebody that they believe in and inspires them to be great. And uh, so tonight uh, we celebrate you, uh, Mr. Ship, as you uh, go off into retirement. This is perfect timing that we celebrate CTE tonight and we get this opportunity to celebrate you. And so uh, it's my honor to present you with your plaque honoring your 34 years uh, of education years. and we wish you all the best. So congratulations. <laughs> It, and I know you all know Mr. Ship, but if class personified, this is uh, this is who he is. So uh, thank you. I don't know if you want to. I do. I just, just a few brief comments. I, I know we're busy, but there are a couple of things I want to share with you. When I came to Conroe ISD, people asked me, Greg, what it's what's it like to be with with Conroe? And I and I would tell them, if you like to drink coffee and sit around the office and shoot the breeze quite cavalier, this is probably not the agency for you. <laughs> <laughs> I came right off of a career in technical education charter school campus where I was principal and, and when I got to Conroe I thought I was running as hard as I could and what I found was I was not running nearly hard enough and what a pleasure it is to be a part of a team that is so focused on students I had a chance to work with school districts throughout the state of Texas when I was with the region region education service center and one of the questions I would ask school administrators and school boards is are you making decisions based on the needs of your system are the needs of your students and ladies and gentlemen how pleased I am to tell you that in Conroe ISD we make decisions based on the needs of our students what a privilege it's been for me to be a part of this team like all of you I listened to Dr. Curtis Null when he has his address on YouTube and my thought is what an extraordinary leader for extraordinary times and how fortunate we are to have Dr. Knowles' leadership. 
as I've traveled the district for, I've been on a, a world tour of Conroe ISD for the past uh, month or so, and out visiting my career tech teachers, and over and over and over again, what I've shared with the staff is how fortunate I am to have had an opportunity to be a part of this team. How fortunate I am to work with the very best and brightest. I work with Carrie Gladys, and I, I can't tell you what it means to me <coughs> when I call and Carrie picks up the phone. <laughs> And for a guy like me to have access to a Carrie Gladys, and Carrie, thank you for leaving me feeling smarter than I really am after every phone call. <laughs> Your uh, presentation at the administrative conference was absolutely one of the highlights of the year for me, and I knew if I listened to you, I was going to be a better administrator and help better serve our district. Ms. Gladys, Dr. Null, Dr. Null's leadership team, our board, oh my goodness, what an extraordinary board we had. So intensely focused, so well informed, so passionate about the children we serve. All I can say to you is thank you. Uh, where's Dr. Hines? Dr. Hines made the call. Now I was at my charter school and I, and I told this story last week. When I realized he was offering me the job, I said yes. And he said, don't you want to know the salary? And I said, nope, because it didn't matter. When you have an opportunity to come to Conroe ISD, that's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Dr. Knoll, Mr. President, board members, my loved teachers, Dr. Matt Clark, what a lucky man I have been. Thank you all so very much. Kind of want to let that sit in for a little bit before we move on. But yeah, I you don't want to be the next the next item, that's for yeah. sure. Yeah, <laughs> the, the, the show must go on. But uh, thank you, Mr. Ship, as well as my comments from last month still still linger. So thank you for for who you are and what you do for this, this what you've done for this district. Miss Godfrey, do we have anybody signed up for? Uh, okay, very good. Uh, moving on to item four, which is the consent agenda. I have not heard from anybody to pull any items. Do we have a motion? Motion to approve as presented. Second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor, uplifted hand. Any opposed, same sign? Very good. Item five, administration <coughs> consider <coughs> approval of district of innovation plan. Dr. Noel. Okay, Dr. Chris Hines. <coughs> Good evening, President Hubert, members of the board, Dr. No. I'd like to bring forward to you uh, tonight's, the, for your consideration for approval, is the District of Innovation. Just to kind of recap some of the information about the District of Innovation, it is something that is provided for in our Texas Education Code. Uh, it's a designation that allows a school district to exempt itself from various state laws. And in 2015, the district became a district of innovation and exempted itself from only one provision, and that was the one that was um, pertaining to starting school prior to the fourth Monday in August. And to maintain its designation as a district of innovation, a district must review and update its innovation plan every five years. And it is now that time for us to renew and revisit our district of innovation uh, designation status. And on October the 20th, a public hearing was held during the board meeting. After the hearing, the Board of Trustees approved a resolution initiating this process of renewing our district's designation as a district of innovation. And the board also designated the district level planning and decision making committee, which includes teachers, administrators, parents, and community members, as the committee to develop the district of innovation plan. Now, the DOI committee, after reviewing public feedback, approved a DOI plan for recommendation to the Board of Trustees. In addition to continuing the exemption from uh, the start time, the, the, being the fourth Monday in August, the plan includes a waiver from requirements of the Texas Education Code which pertain to teacher certification. Specifically, the exemption will allow the district to hire teachers for hard-to-fill educa uh, career education programs such as welding or automotive technology and health sciences. This specific waiver is recommended by our, also by our district director of CTE, Mr. Ship, and was also supported by two of the high school principals that were serving on the DOI committee. 
So just to kind of summarize what our district of innovation contains, it has two parts. One is proposed that students may begin instruction earlier than the fourth Monday in August. And obviously that's important uh, because it's allowed us to have calendars the last few years um, that have more balanced days of instruction. Um, and so we have been able to achieve uh, better balance. Uh, it does mean starting earlier. It also enables us to conclude that semester prior to winter break. And then the other one, as I mentioned already, is uh, pertaining to teacher certification. And that is proposed a teacher, a person may be employed as a teacher without an appropriate certificate or permit issued by subchapter B of the Texas Education Code if the person in the subject matter to be taught has relevant work experience, formal training or education, and licensure or certification or registration. Now the district would use this exemption to fill CTE positions in areas where it cannot find qualified applicants. So we would always go through that process first. Um, and we've had a couple over the years where we haven't been able to start programs. This benefits the students of the district by providing opportunities for the district to consider qualified industry professionals who may have industry training and certification but may not hold uh, a teacher certification. And just to kind of remind, this has become, become even more important when we switched over to endorsements at the high school level, which um, emphasize specific units of study, including business and industry. And so many of our students seek to earn endorsements in areas such as manufacturing or technology and health sciences. And sometimes finding certified teachers uh, in these positions can be difficult. It often depends on the economy and, uh, and how that goes. An exemption from this will allow the district to hire qualified candidates who may not be certified teachers, but who bring authentic field and industry knowledge and skills to the classroom. Such professionals can provide students with not only unparalleled learning experiences, but also real world work experiences as they typically hold multiple certificates in their areas of expertise. Uh, so there was discussion and certainly we know we wanted to make sure we put in some protections to make sure that this wasn't just uh, used without some thought. So to ensure that this exception is used to obtain the most qualified candidate, the district will implement, implement administrative procedures that require establishing credential guidelines for the position prior to doing this, two, is ensuring that there is a training plan for this position, and then three, seeking the superintendent's approval. Uh, we would establish local credential guidelines that require the subject matter be taught, some kind of requisite experience, and it would be based on the particular area. Um, and then teachers would also be required to get training in pedagogy and classroom management. And then we would certainly offer this for review by the superintendent prior to doing this. And then the superintendent can update the board periodically if we do this and how often we do it. So we tried to build in some practices to ensure that we just didn't do this unnecessarily. So just some reminders about the plan. Um, it must be renewed in five years. The board can terminate or amend this district of innovation plan at any time by following the procedures set out in chapter 12a and, and just also a reminder that just because we approve the plan it doesn't compel our district to actually use any of these exemptions so if we wanted to for example not start school till the fourth monday we can always do that or if we didn't choose to hire anyone without a certificate we can certainly consider it, still do that so at this point, I just want to say that the district level planning decision making team does respectfully request your approval of the plan. Okay, very good. Thank you, Dr. Hines. Do we have do we have a motion? A second motion. Motion and a second. Any questions for Dr. Hines? Yes, I, I do have one, and I don't know if this is a Dr. Hines question or Mrs. Galatis question, and I hate to put either one of you on the spot, but um, in reading through the way that the, the proposed language is written, and then looking at the explanation um, provided, this is, is designed to address CTE, but in the language in the proposed statement, it doesn't specifically mention CTE. And perhaps number three is the catch-all there where we include licensure, certification, and registration. I'm just, I'm imagining some, some, some scenarios in my mind where somebody who works, has worked as construction materials testing decides they want to teach physics or something like that. Um, and I, I mean, I'm fully on board with the CTE component of it, but since I don't see that specified in the proposed language, that and, works. and that's really we're writing kind of our specific rules. We're asking for a waiver from the one rule, which is very broad. 
its certification. So we're asking for a waiver from a very broad rule, and through our explanation, what we're explaining is our intended application would be very narrow for. So CT. our explanation is part of the official document yes. that's on file. With yes, the we year. will we will post that on our website. Okay. Okay. I was concerned that only the yes, it, but that's why we're we're asking from an exception from the rule as it exists. We're explaining how we will apply it. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Dr. Hines, I, and I think I know the answer, but so we have teachers that come that may not be certified, but they want to go back and get an alternate certification because they came from industry and now want to teach. This is not the same thing, is my understanding. We are basically exempting them from having to get any teaching certification, but we are putting them through some pedagogy of, of classroom management and yeah. And I really, yes, the answer to your question is yes. And, okay. and and honestly, I don't really know that there are too many times that we would actually ever use this. There, You know, I think there was a, I was racking my brain um, way back when, when I was principal at Oak Ridge High School, we were trying to start a healthcare science program and we just couldn't find anybody. And we didn't start it for a year because we couldn't find anybody at that point. And, and I remember talking to a, a, a applicant who had been a nurse for several years um, and she was just like, yeah, I just don't know if I'm going to go back to school. But I, I train all these new nurses, and mm -hmm. so she had a lot of qualifications, and, and that's probably the best example I can give you of somewhere we might say, yeah, this might be a time we need to do that. Right. Um, generally, a lot of folks would be willing to enter into an alternative certification program, and that certainly is the best route because it mm -hmm. formalizes the training. Mm -hmm. So, it, again, I'm not you know, anticipating this is something we would use very often. Right. But it's nice to have. And as a follow-up, my understanding, though, is the way it, the language is written, we would go through the normal process and try to find a certified teacher. Should we come up short in that area and not be that able to? That would trigger to, this, yes. Then that triggers the exemption. Yes, sir. Okay. That's how we would use it. We would go through the normal process, and then if we don't have any luck, we'd circle back and trigger this process. Thank you. Very good. Any other questions? All right. All those in favor of the motion, without please. Yeah, very good. Any against? All right. Motion passes. Thank you very much. All right. On to item 6A. Uh, Five, five A. Yeah, five B. Five B. Mr. Hubert, if you don't, if you don't there mind, if we could uh, circle um, back. M Mr. Hom has just arrived, and so yes. uh, perhaps we could take a moment and, and allow Mr. Moore to present him with this plaque, maybe, and, and get a photo. Please um, do, yes. Mr. Hom, thank you for. Uh, uh, we we celebrated you all earlier. Sorry that you couldn't be here, but we want to celebrate you now because we appreciate all that you do. So let's give a hand to Mr. Hom and the work that he did. Didn't you? Thank you for uh, allowing us to do that. You bet. All right. Absolutely. Now we'll move on then to uh, 5B and we'll go back to Dr. Hines yes. for attendance boundaries. Thank you very much, President Hubert, members of the board, Dr. Noll. Uh, tonight we want to bring forward as information, uh, kind of a, catch you up a little bit on the work that the attendance boundary committee has been um, undertaking the last several weeks. We started back in September. And just again to kind of remind everybody of this process, we will be opening a new uh, elementary school in August of 2021. That is Reuben W. Hope Junior Elementary School. It will serve students in grades pre-K through fourth. And it is located at 14755 in the Granger Pines Way in the Granger Pines development. And just kind of to give a little bit of orientation, that is uh, a view looking down of 3083 and up to the north is actually Milam and um, Grangerland campuses. Mm -hmm. You can see into the very top of the screen, Caney Creek High School, just to get you oriented, that's a neighborhood going in. And in the neighborhood is going to be Hope Elementary. And I know Mr. Foster will show some more updated pictures than what I have, and so he'll have some better pictures tonight. But this was probably about six weeks ago of where we were in construction. Um, this was that aerial view. And you can see the neighborhood off in the distance, and they've certainly put in even more houses since then. 
The most common reason that we adjust attendance boundaries is that we uh, open a new school to meet the demands of growth. We are growing. Our enrollment um, as of yesterday was 64,774 students. We ended last year with an enrollment of 64,450 students, and certainly we've grown probably less than a, a thousand than what we thought we would have. Um, so we were a little bit short on our projections this year. We know that's not atypical. It's pretty common throughout the state and this, this nation. So why are we doing this? Why are we adding a campus out there? Well, we, we have some schools that are crowded. Austin Elementary has a capacity of roughly 900 students. It currently has an enrollment of over 1,000 students and uses 11 portable classrooms. By 2028, it is projected at fit over 1,500 students. Creighton Elementary with a capacity of 675 students ended uh, the previous school year with an enrollment of over 800 students and it has currently 10 portable classrooms and it's also projected to grow to over 1,000 by 2028. San Jacinto Elementary, which is also not a very large school, is a, a concluded last year with 620 students, has a capacity of roughly 750 students. In 2028, that area is projected to have an enrollment of almost 1,300 students. And we know some of these projections may change post-COVID. We'll see how uh, things develop in the next couple of years, but we, we know that growth will continue. Patterson Elementary, which is in the Conroe feeder, finished 2020 with an enrollment of 948 students with a capacity of 925, and it currently has two portable classrooms on site. This is just a kind of a map of showing the different boundaries. If you'll note that dark blue line that kind of runs is actually the separation between Bosman Intermediate and Grangerland Intermediate School. And that area that's in the darker red represents that part that goes currently goes to Austin Elementary that is actually goes back to Bosman and then Stockton and then Conroe High School. So I made a note of that because that's something we looked at during this process. The tan area at the bottom is the San Jacinto attendance boundary. The blue is the Milam. Uh, the light green is the Creighton zone. And so as we go through um, and kind of show you some of the recommended changes, it, it'll begin to make a little bit more sense. And I do apologize. But we also have some larger maps over uh, if you want to look at those later on. Also highlighted on this map kind of which parts of this attendance boundary or area is growing, and these are the shaded areas are where we know that there's projected growth in the next few years. And these are the projects that we're aware of, and there's probably a few more that uh, are coming online all the time. It does get confusing when we talk numbers, and I just always give the disclaimer. We always refer to geocoded, which is the number of students that actually live in an area. Um, which is different from who actually goes to a school. And uh, enrollment will fluctuate. Usually it's, um, there's more students enrolled than are actually geocoded because teachers often bring their children to school with them or we might have a special program where students come to that school to attend the program. And um, pre-K is an example of that. Not all of our schools have bilingual programs. So this was just kind of a quick summary. Again, I won't read through all of the lines, but. Um, you can kind of see where we're at capacity and where we are currently. Some schools are a little bit smaller than where they finished last year. Some are larger, um, but we're projected to go keep getting larger in that area. So when we start a process, we always kind of make sure we understand what are we trying to accomplish so we'll know whether or not what we present to you is achieving our goals. So first and foremost, we wanted to establish a boundary that will populate this new school. We also wanted to provide crowding relief and some future capacity for Austin and Creighton, as well as San Jacinto Elementary Schools. Uh, just to kind of summarize, we are projected to have uh, over 4,000 students in this feeder by 2025 with a capacity, when we open HOPE, of 4,175. So we, when we bring this campus online, we will be, uh, certainly we will have the room to support the student enrollment. Without HOPE, we are going to be way under capacity. And the eight-year projection is almost 5,000 students, so we know we're going to need an elementary uh, in the next few years. Dr. Hatch, do these number include the pre-K students that we'll be bringing These on? include our pre-K based on pretty much the same averages that we're using okay. now. So um, we, you know, this was our first year of full-day pre-K, mm -hmm. and we expected a little bit of an increase in the percentage of attendance. We didn't realize that this year, so we'll see if that plays out in the next couple of years. This is a challenging process, and the committee understands that. We know schools are communities. 
Uh, families often have a history with a particular school. They often choose where they live to go to a particular school. We know when we change boundaries, we disrupt routines because they're on their way to where they're going. Um, we have, and we haven't opened an elementary in the Candy Creek feeder in several years. So um, this is not something we've had to do in a while. And uh, it's, 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 a, it's a change. Um, and we, and we knew this going in that in order to achieve the objectives that we set out, we were going to have to move a lot of people because of where the schools are. We were going to have to do some shifting. So we had some goals I always through this process. We want to be mindful that we want a quality education. That's our mission. We want our schools to be top notch. So regardless of how this lands, we want people to be happy with their schools. We established an ABC or an attendance boundary committee, and we have had an outstanding committee that has worked on this, as I said, for the last three months, and they've done a great job. Um, we draw boundaries that support efficient and effective use of our facilities and maintain fiscal responsibility. We want to reduce enrollment at overcrowded campuses. One of our goals is to try to get out of the portable business where we can. So we certainly uh, set out to, to try to accomplish that. Um, we also wanted to plan and allow for growth uh, through our new and existing campuses and future growth. And so we want to think about that as we went through this. We know that next year we'll actually start this process for a new K-6 campus that will come online in Conroe a, a year after that. So um, that is one we'll start planning for. So there's, we were thinking about that a little bit as we started talking about Patterson uh, and Anderson. Um, we also, we know we're going to have another elementary. We think it's going to be somewhere in the 242 corridor. So we were trying to be mindful of that as we were working on this. Uh, we know that in 2023, we plan to open a larger replacement junior high school for Moorhead. And at that point, the current Moorhead campus is slated to be converted back to an intermediate campus. So we want to be mindful of that too, as we go through this process. So again, I mentioned we had an outstanding committee. Um, Co-facilitating with this was Mr. McCord, and he'll join up, join up me up here in a minute to uh, present some information about the maps. But that was our committee. They did a great job. We looked at a lot of things. We considered capacities, input. We looked at demographic factors, history, uh, geographical proximity, locations. We wanted to minimize impact. Um, but as we kind of learned through this process to do what we needed to do, we were going to have to impact a lot of folks. Um, and again, I mentioned some of these other things that we've already looked at. Oops. We also looked at mileage and driving, and, and our hope was to improve the commute for everybody. We know that some, some folks in this plan will have further drives and some will have shorter. Um, but we did look at that process and tried to be as efficient as we can. We have had three different um, presentations that we've made publicly through our Zoom presentations. Uh, we just had one last week, and all those are recorded and currently on our, on our website. The committee worked through several different versions, uh, of which we brought forward three in November for public feedback. They were 6.4, uh, 7, and Scenario 7.1. So those are the three that we kind of landed on after studying many others. Uh, and our committee choice is 7-0. Um, and just to kind of give you a few highlights of what's in these scenarios and what they, what they bring, um, and each of them had pros and cons, and they were really kind of minor tweaks. Once we kind of ruled out the things that we didn't like or we didn't think made sense, uh, we, we kind of narrowed down to these three, and they have different variations. Uh, one thing I will point out in 7 and 7.1, both of those offered movement of students out of Austin, uh, back to Patterson, and then moving some students from Patterson to Anderson. And uh, so 7, which again is our, our uh, preferred one, and uh, Mr. McCord will share that, that's kind of one of the features that's different from 6.4. The other one is it deals with some of the movement out of San Jacinto, and you'll notice that in um, scenario seven, San Jacinto comes out a little bit larger. And we really didn't want to make San Jacinto too small because we think it's going to be significantly impacted with the next school. So we want to let it grow um, so it'll be easier to split in the future. So uh, trying to look at that. But you can see Milam is one of the schools that gets impacted significantly because, and you'll see from the maps, to populate Hope, most of the students are going to come from My Milam a few from San Jacinto, and then a lot of the students from Creighton will slide down to Milam. Uh, so those are some schools that 
a lot of impact. And so there's impact incoming, outgoing. I said there's pros and cons, but, but we felt good about 7.0. And I'm going to let Mr. McCord kind of walk you through some of the features in these three maps. Good evening. I want to start by just reiterating that all three of the community presentations are on our website and are available to view on YouTube. And in these presentations, we take a lot of time to break down subdivisions, street names, real places where real students that we care about live and how they would be impacted. So uh, I'm going to give you an overview tonight, but those presentations online really get down to the nitty gritty with street names if you want to look at that later. So we'll start the overview, and we're going to start with scenario 6.4. And I think it's worth noting on 6.4, 6.4 does changes of alignment, and all those alignment changes are contained within the Caney Creek zone, as Dr. Hines had mentioned. So let's just start with the quick overview, and you'll find uh, Austin and Creighton. You're moving from Austin to Creighton, centrally located in orange. You'll see students that would move from Austin in the north to Creighton, located in orange. Students that would remain in scenario 6.4 as part of Creighton and already attend there are in yellow. Transitioning as you go south, you'll see from Creighton to Milam, you'll see the darker blue area, or at least it's kind of dark. You'll see that area. Those kids would be transitioning from Creighton to Milam. Also, the lighter blue areas indicate zones that would remain from Milam that currently are Milam at this time. Uh, going down south again, crossing over from Milam to the brand new Hope Elementary. If you'll look south and you'll see it represented by the purple shading, a number of areas there. And if you go all the way down to the south to San Jacinto, the impact to San Jacinto under scenario 6.4 would be two areas would move from San Jacinto to the new, to the new Hope Elementary and that would be 31B and 33C. And we'll come back to 33C uh, shortly. Here's a quick overview of a table, and it shows you, I think this helps to see the map. So this is what the map would look like when it's concluded if implemented under scenario 6.4. And you can see how it would look aesthetically and for movement and roads. I think one thing, if you look here in the table that stands out to us, and I think it was a major reason that our committee did not bring forth this as our main recommendation would be the size impact of San Jacinto. Uh, San Jacinto would remain uh, pretty, it would not remain, it would be very small. And it would be small, but it would also be on the verge of starting to impact some of the programs. So that is one reason 6.4 would not be impacted. Also, you see Patterson. Patterson really receives little or no, well, no relief uh, at all under version 6.4. Dr. Hines. So a summary, 33C to Hope would allow, I talked about 33C because it's a fast growing area, would allow the school to open Hope with a larger amount of students, 400 or over. San Jacinto would have a smaller number of students and that was one of our cons when it came to 6.4. Creighton is 641 in all three scenarios. So it would be smaller than it is now. It would be within its population totals that it can hold but it was 641 in all three totals. Austin remains larger, and it really, we'll talk about this in just a moment, it does not solve the fact that students from, the, from Austin are split into two different intermediate feeders. So that is also a con within 6.4. So we're gonna flip on over to 7.1, and uh, I'll be a little bit repetitive, but I'll try to keep it minimal. So once again, you see orange, orange coming from Austin to Creighton, yellow, students that are would be in Creighton if 7.1 was implemented and reside in uh, the zone now for that school. Transitioning to the south, you'll see Creighton to Milam in dark blue. You'll see the lighter blue zones represent areas that are in Milam now and would remain so. Now, here's what starts getting important to me is notice different from 6.4 crossing over from Patterson to Anderson up top in, I call it steel blue, but it's blue. In the steel blue shading, you'll see 13 and D14 sections. 13 and D14 sections up in the northwest, they would transition from Patterson to Anderson. Likewise, transitioning in the green, at least it's green to me, likewise transitioning from Austin to Patterson and green on the west side are 26C and 27A. This is important because note, this would take them from the Candy Creek feeder 
to the Conroe High School feeder cleanly pre-kindergarten through 12th grade. Going down south, changing from Milam to the, no, to the new Hope Elementary in purple as before, purple would denote the Hope Elementary uh, boundaries. Specifically, San Jacinto would lose two sections on its border in this iteration, 31B to the new Hope Elementary there on the east, and also 33C, which would be on the western side, which is, I said earlier, a fast-growing area. So it's really kind of in summary, it's noteworthy that 26C and 27A there in the west would move from Austin to Patterson. And Patterson in this iteration, version 7.1, Patterson does get some relief and Anderson gets kids that it can very easily hold. So it solves more uh, things than the first version 6.4 does. And going on to the next slide, here's kind of a uh, overview. It, it does provide a larger geographical footprint for Milam. So, Dr. Hines, can you go backward just one? So you'll see that there in the biggest, the larger geographical footprint is really that 34A section there on the western side. So that, that is something that will contrast uh, to version 7.0. So if we can go back to the next slide, Dr. Hines. San Jacinto would still have a smaller number of students, which is a major con, was a major con, and is a major con for the committee. Creighton still is 641. Austin, look there. It does receive some substantial relief for Austin. It does help them. Milam increases to a good number. Hope will be 400 or over once everybody's there. It gives better numbers to Patterson. It gives better numbers to Anderson. Note that version 7.1, scenario 7.1, does move the largest total number of students of all three iterations that we look at. So that is 7.1 and going to the next slide. This is the version that the committee overwhelmingly uh, supports and is recommending. It, it also addresses a larger number of issues, providing boundary help not just to the Caney Creek Zone, but also to Conroe High. Again, as with the, uh, the previous iterations, orange is from Austin to Creighton, yellow is existing Creighton students. Transitioning from Creighton to Milam is the dark blue and it really looks dark blue in this picture. That's very helpful. The light blue zones still represent areas that are, that are Milam now and would remain so. Crossing over from Patterson to Anderson at the top left in steel blue, that would be Patterson to Anderson once that's 13 and D14. Likewise, just like with the previous version, transitioning from Austin to Patterson in green. And remember, that's not just going from Austin to Patterson. That's going from the Caney Creek zone to the Conroe High zone, or 26C and 27A. You can see purple, most of the purple moving from Milam to Hope Elementary. Uh, now, this version too, low, and Dr. Hines could point out, so 34A in this version would go to, uh, to Hope. And what that does, it really gives a larger geographical footprint to Hope as Hope begins to get established as a school. Uh, San Jacinto Elementary in this iteration only loses one section, and that is 31B there in the southeast corner. And that leaves 33C uh, right there. And a valuable reason to leave 33C there is that is a fast growth area. And as we possibly, pl well, we, we plan to open up a new uh, flex school in Caney Creek. That gives us some ability to be more flexible uh, because it's going to be a larger number of students in San Jacinto. And once we start having to go back and relook at this again, that will be very, very helpful to us. And, you know, I just think it's really important having kids of my own, understanding how the world works. If you look at the green, just having 26C and 27A cleanly in the Conroe feeder is nice. You see Patterson get relief, and I think that is helpful. So uh, I just looking back, uh, just going over the greatest positives coming out of the committee for scenario 7.0. And it separates from the other options to us are this, is that San Jacinto would retain a population of over 400, giving a lot more flexibility and ability to have really effective functioning programs everywhere, including San Jacinto. 7.0 will allow us to maintain a bilingual program at San Jacinto. And it's very important to their students, their parents, the school, and the community. By keeping, as I mentioned, 33C with 7.0, it gives us ability to maneuver when a new Caney Creek feeder uh, elementary comes online. 
It, like I said, it keeps for, hope over 400, keeps all the schools north of 400, keeps all their programs in all likelihood. And we talked about 26C and 27A. I mentioned that being cleanly in the Conroe feeder. So those are our, uh, here's a summary of it. And it just really reiterates what I just said. You can look at the numbers. The numbers are really attractive compared to the others. I would direct you here too. You can see the bilingual numbers in the middle table. And you can see what this brings to the table, yeah, well, literally, is that uh, being able to keep that bilingual program at San Jacinto, which is really important to us. And it was really important to the committee. And then uh, down at the end, you know, these are real children and real people and real families, which is why I value and appreciate all the committee's efforts in coming up with this. But if you see at the bottom, it shows you the impact, the incoming and outgoing impact of students in the real world that would uh, affect each of the campuses from Austin, Creighton, Hope, Milam, San Jacinto, Patterson, and Anderson. The greatest impact would be at Milam. Generally, if you look at the map, what's happening is to, to populate the schools and do it right, we're, we're pulling people from north to south, and at the very bottom, pulling people from south to north. And uh, so Milam would be impacted the most, but under 7.0, Milam would be in great shape. Here's a table that shows you the numbers. and. Uh, it's really playing chess, not checkers, and it gives Patterson help and it addresses issues to the far northwest and to the far southeast and everywhere in between. So there's a summary, and I think that's it, Dr. Hines. And I think you're going to speak to this. I will. Um, I want to mention that, as we mentioned, we would start to look at the intermediate potential feeders. This is just a sample of what an intermediate map might look like based on that version, where the light blue represents really what is the combination of Austin under 7.0 uh, with Creighton under 7.0 going to the new school, which is currently would be the, the current Moorhead Junior High, uh, the Hope feeder zone and the um, San Jacinto feeder zone would both feed into Grangerland Intermediate, and then Milam, being where it's located right in the middle, would be split in two. And, but that would give a nice size cohort so that um, when the fourth grade splits, about half would go to one intermediate and half would go to the other. And so it gives a pretty good split. Uh, that's just an example. Obviously, we'll come back and study that uh, in a couple of years, but we wanted to at least look at some possibilities as we work through this. I would share that our attendance boundary committee uh, did not take this task of changing boundaries lightly. It recognizes the impact that this change has on families uh, as it works to achieve the goals. Uh, we are committed to providing quality educational experience at all of our schools, and we do plan to come back in January and bring you our recommendation for your uh, consideration. Dr. Hines, one thing I would say too is just the committee, one thing that, you know, having been a kid myself, now 54, look 53, and have kids of my own, is that it's for us, we wanted to bring a, a sufficient number of kids and have the, the schools populated in a method of which kids go, if they're transitioning campus, they're going with enough kids that they're with their friends. Mm -hmm. And at my age, if I eat lunch by myself, that's one of the best days of my life. <laughs> but for a kid, seriously, the kids that you're in class with, and the kids you walk the halls with and the kids that you eat lunch with, it's not everything, but it's close. So that is another major factor in our decision to recommend version 7.0 to you. Thank you. Sounds like, like we need to get you on a buddy system yeah. or something. Right? I, have, I have one question. Dr. Hines, if you could pull up, probably the intermediate map might be the easiest one to see. I think it was zoomed in the tightest. So Hope sits in F33. What are the transportation implications of that 33C. Is there an easy way like into the, let's call it the back of Granger Pines without having to come all the way around 3083? Because I noticed a cut like 6.4 and 7.1 had that one coming up to Hope and 7.0 leaves it down at San so Jacinto. The way right now you enter Granger Pines is going to be down 3083 corridor. Anyway, okay. so it's, and it's not far. It's like within about when you turn into the neighborhood, you see the school. Right. right. Yeah. I was just curious how, how far they had to come, if they had to go all the way around to Old Houston and up to 3083 or what the transportation implications well, they would have, were between Yeah, the they two. would cut probably Old Houston and then hang a left on 3083 is how we had them going. Okay. And it's, um, and that is an area, you know, most of these areas have, 
not been rezoned in a long time, but at some point they did go to another school, and so it's kind of interesting. Um, you know, sometimes we were brought, brought this up with transportation, and they'll say, oh yeah, way back when, we used to drive that way, so, uh, but that is how they would go. It, 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 again, I'm, and to go back and reiterate, one of the reasons I think was a strong reason for seven is to not move 33C. It's a lot of students, and, and if we're gonna open a school in the 242 corridor down the road, we don't want, we try to avoid moving the same group of students within a four year period mm -hmm. if we can avoid that. Okay. Have we had any conversations since 33C and F33 are growing so fast? Have we had any conversations with the county or the developers about roads cutting through north to south between those two areas? We've certainly been talking with the developers. There's, um, you know, right now there's a, there's a, there is a plan to bring Artavia across 1314, so that will cut through, um, and that will be significant. Um, you know, I'm not aware yet of anything that's going to go back to 3083 to the north. Okay. But a lot of that's oil fields in there, and there's some tricky low land and some other challenges. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? No. Uh, I have a question: Is um, did y'all? In, in putting these together, the, the social economic makeup of these schools, will they be impacted from those that are already, you know, the established schools? Is there going to be a very big impact in that for these schools? We can get that information to you, but looking at it, it's, it'd be very negligible. You have it. I have, I mean, I have the, the answer to that is it's very, very, all these schools, all these campuses have um, economically disadvantaged populations of over 80%. Mm -hmm. and so. All okay. of them stay in that range, and nobody moves more than about five percent. Nobody loses Title One funding. No. For nobody. Like no. Board to die. Okay. okay. Very good. Awesome. Anything else? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Appreciate your time. Thank good you. work. And, and go back to the committee and tell them we appreciate their their efforts in this as well. They're not envied positions. I know that. Very good. Okay. Now I can move to 6A, consider approval of the guaranteed max price amendment for the Crichton overhaul project and authorize the superintendent to negotiate and execute the contract documents. Dr. All right, Mr. Foster, we'll come forward for these next few items. All those updates we were getting for the schools, I wonder if you're getting antsy about it. That's I right. to show yours. Yeah, he's the, that's an old picture. He wants to show the new one. That's his pictures. <laughs> well, they're coming, I promise. So President Hubert, members of the board, and Dr. Null, it's my pleasure to bring forward for your consideration and approval a guaranteed maximum price amendment for our Creighton Elementary overall project. And then that authorize Dr. Null to complete and execute the contract documents. So if you recall, in March of 2020, we selected Ellisor Constructors to be our construction manager at risk for Creighton Elementary's overall. They've been working with IBI Group, our design team, uh, to develop the scope. And together, we've negotiated a guaranteed maximum price of $8,923,874 for this project. And I'd like to point out we did meet our budget targets for our design and our scope that we planned uh, with the bond and, and uh, general funds for the project. So at this time, we're requesting your approval. Very good. I need a motion. So moved. I have a motion. Second. And a second. Any discussion? Okay. Yes, sir. I have a question. Yes, sir. Um, how old is that school? Uh, Creighton was opened originally in 1980. Okay. 1980 and this is the first time we've really done any major renovation yes sir i mean so the scope I mean, of the work well, we, is pretty massive correct so over the over the years there's been minor uh, right. work done there but this is essentially uh everything in the basically in the walls and above the ceiling so uh new air conditioning systems new ductwork new handlers new equipment uh we're adding a fire sprinkler system to the project because uh, it's one of the few buildings remaining that did not have a fire sprinkler system it's getting the full gamut of safety and security upgrades for fire alarms radios first response radios so it is it is a uh, complete redo of that campus so it should be good for another you know 40 years 40 years so 40 yes, years sir. is a pretty good life out of a building right to start Absolutely. with yes sir and we're going to be able to get like you said probably another 40 years out of it yes sir thank you awesome any other questions all right seeing none all those in favor raise your right hand Check. very good motion passes thank you mr foster uh, item B, consider approval of a guarantee maximum price amendment for the campus renovation 2021 project and authorize the superintendent to negotiate and execute the contract documents. Dr. Noble. Hey, Mr. Foster. Well, at this time, we're bringing forward for your consideration and approval uh, somewhat of an annual project, which is our campus renovations of, for 2021 
which is a project where we take buildings and replace building systems so hopefully we can avoid large projects like the Creighton overall project we've got behind us as we move forward through the district. So the Campus Renovations 2021, uh, if you'll recall, in June of 2020, we selected GTT general contractors to be our construction manager at risk for this project. And like with Ellisor, they've been working with the IBI group, the design team selected for this project. Together, we've worked uh, through the scope and the budget and, the, and came up with a guaranteed maximum price of seven, guaranteed maximum price of $7,695,000. And we're working primarily here at Armstrong Elementary, which is a kitchen overhaul, kitchen addition to uh, make a more uh, efficient and uh, better to serve the, the population in Armstrong. And we're doing a, a, a systems overhaul at Riot Elementary, which is air conditioning upgrades, much like we do at a campus uh, every summer. And this is, at this time, we're requesting your approval. Very good. We need a motion. Move approval. Uh, have a motion. Second. We have a second. Any questions? Seeing none, all those in favor? Any opposed? Very good. Motion passes. Uh, item D, we're at D or at C? C, we're at C. C. Consider approval of the guaranteed maximum price amendment for the new junior high school in the Canning Creek Feeder and East County Transportation Center project and authorize the superintendent to negotiate and execute the contract documents. All right, Mr. Foster. At this time, we're bringing forward for your consideration and approval uh, guaranteed maximum price for a new junior high school in the Canyon Creek feeder zone uh, and also an East County Transportation Center project. And again, to authorize Dr. Nall to complete and execute the contract documents. So in February, uh, you, our Board of Trustees, selected Joris General Contractors to be our construction manager at risk for this project. We paired them with PBK Architects, and together they've worked together uh, and generated the scope uh, for both the junior high and the transportation center. Uh, for that project, uh, we've negotiated a guaranteed maximum price of sixty-seven million four hundred fifteen thousand seventy-seven dollars, and we're this time we're requesting your approval. All right, we have a motion. So move. We have a motion. Any seconds? Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Any questions for Mr. Foster? Yes, sir. All right. Um, in comparison to the cost of Stockton Junior High, how does this one fare? So it, this is a little bit more expensive than Stockton, mainly because the building is physically larger. So the Stockton Junior High had a uh, capacity of 1,400 students. So the new Caney Creek Junior High is scheduled for 1,600 students. So it grew uh, several science labs, several classrooms uh, in overall capacity. Uh, it also has some, some water issues on that site. So not to mention drainage, but I'm talking about domestic water. So we've included right. uh, the conversion of Caney Creek High School's football to well. field to a turf field to right. free up some water from our wells that we own and operate mm -hmm. to be able to uh, deal with that with this campus. Uh, but it does include some of the things that Stockton had that just return on our investment. So the solar panels that we had at Stockton, yes. which have been successful, uh, will continue uh, at this campus. Uh, with a combination of the transportation center which we, we tried to get more than we're, we're bringing to you, but we got everything that we promised uh, when we were advertising the bond. Uh, we'll be able to use the covered bus area to uh, use the, to set up the solar panels rather than using clear ground area. Okay. I mean, so we're trying to make use of the, uh, the structures more efficiently. Mm -hmm. uh, and together we feel like we've, we've met all of our budget targets uh, for the scope that we wanted. Thank you. Very good. Any other questions? Yes, sir. No? Very good. All right, those in favor of the motion? Any opposed? Very good. Motion passes. Thank you very much. And on to D, receive capital improvement updates. Mr. Foster. All right, this is where I get to show you my up-to-date pictures. Uh, for our capital improvements we have underway throughout the district. So I'm going to start with Hope Elementary, uh, which in the near future we'll have an attendance boundary for, which is a good thing because the project is on schedule. Uh, scheduled to open August of 21. Um, so you can see from this overhead shot. It's the same angle that we showed you last month, but so you can see the progress. The, we're calling the building uh, a dry state currently, so the windows are in. The masonry is about 80% complete, so they're, they're worked from the back to the front. Uh, so if you were to drive by there now, you'll see they're working on the brick and the, and the brickwork in the front of the building. Uh, on the inside, we're starting to see building systems, things come together. So this is a, a framing shot of the interior of the library. Um, so it just kind of shows you the complexities of things that go on inside the building. Oh, back up. So we're starting to see colors and finishes. Uh, the, the color patterns for Hope Elementary follow the Canyon Creek feeder zone. So you'll start to see that come alive over the next several several months. Uh, we're doing tile work, ceramic work, 
uh, in the bathrooms and restrooms getting ready for uh, the fixtures and, and other things to come into the building. Uh, we are working with Entergy right now on permanent power. So the goal is to turn on the air conditioning systems in the building this month, which is everything seems to be working uh, swimmingly towards that goal, uh, which will put us in a good shape to finish in August, uh, like we were telling. At Runyon Elementary, which is uh, the primary focus is to get a PE classroom. So at Runyon, we had to do some shifting around on the inside. So over the Thanksgiving break, we moved students into the new pre-K classrooms. So as you can see, it's obviously in use with backpacks lining the hallways. A little shot into the classroom. Uh, so we have students in there. So we're not trying to show you pictures of students, but to let you know they are actively using those pre-K classrooms. That freed up other space in the building, which they're actively working on renovating currently. And on the, uh, the gym addition and the library addition that go with it, uh, it is in a dry condition now. On the inside of the gym, they're working on the finishes, putting that together. On the inside of the library, they're working on the finishes, putting that together. The goal is to move the library from its current location into the new facility uh, over the winter break. And then we'll finish up the renovations to the, and recapture classroom space in the main building from where PK, pre-K came out and where the library came out uh, over the, in, during the spring semester and then wrap that project up in the spring. So it is currently on schedule and all the promises the contractors have made for the turnover dates have happened just like they said they would. So everything's going well. At York Junior High, our building addition to increase the overall capacity at York Junior High. You can see it's a uh, multi-story classroom addition uh, and it is a cafeteria expansion in the middle of the screen and then towards the top of the screen is the fine arts and athletics extensions to get the uh, additional capacity we need for the programs in that building. So the first floor slabs are done, the second floor slabs are in, the roof slab or the roof concrete is about to start, and you can see from the scaffold on the bottom of the picture the exterior masonry is, is beginning work on that campus as well. It is scheduled to turn over in August of 21, and it is on schedule. At the Woodlands College Park High School, and it's another building addition, uh, that building addition is to help us reduce our reliance on portables. Uh, that building is, as you can see in the bottom part of the picture, uh, the roof deck is on, the second floor slabs are in, so they're putting the roof membrane on now to bring that building into a dry condition. Masonry will be starting in the very near future. So the building, the classroom addition is on schedule. It's scheduled to turn over in August of 21. Uh, but at the main campus, so College Park is old enough that we've worn out the carpet. So they're working over the, this Christmas break to start replacing the carpet throughout the building. And that'll continue through, throughout the semester breaks as we get them into the summer and be completed over the summer uh, of 21. We've also been doing full building upgrades. So when we do the uh, a, a square foot addition like we're doing here, we're required to upgrade the fire alarm systems and the radio systems and the access control systems, things of that nature. So just like all of our major projects, the safety and security programs are, are being outfitted at College Park High School while we're there doing that major work. All that work is in progress and it will be completed over the summer. Uh, they started on it earlier uh, in this school year, been working nights and weekends, and it is on schedule and scheduled to be com fully complete in August of 21. This campus is how, 15 years, 16 years? Uh, right at it, so 16, 17 years. Yeah, so 16, 17 years. And it's been, uh, it's been occupied with a large number of students, so mm -hmm. yep. they have stomped uh, pathways in just about all the carpets you can. <laughs> You can see the different roofs as it's been added. Yeah, a lot of additions roofs. there. Yes, yeah. <clears throat> so we're going to move on to the Woodlands High School, which is another building addition to help us reduce our reliance on portables. Uh, this building is also on schedule, it's scheduled to turn over in August of 21. So it's a three-story classroom addition. So the ground floor slabs are in, second and third floor slabs are in. Now the next step is the concrete for the roof deck. And as you can see, the building sheathing uh, and the masonry is set to start on the outside of the building uh, very soon. Uh, to bring that building into a dry condition. And just like at College Park, the Woodlands High School has been getting the safety and security upgrades. Uh, fire alarm upgrades with the building addition uh, go throughout the whole building. So the first responder radio systems, access control, things of that nature. All of that work is in progress. They've been working nights and weekends on the main building as they work on the new addition. And the, that building is on schedule and it is scheduled to turn over in August of 21 as well. And that is our current update. Very good. I mentioned to Mr. Foster this morning, but I, um, I've seen all of the, the work that's, been, that's being done in person, but the, the one that stands out is Runyon Elementary. It's, oh, it's, it's, a, it's a complete change for that campus to have what will be a real library uh, and adding that gym space. So I look forward to being able to take you all to see that uh, when that opens. We'll, we'll make that effort because it's a, 
you, it's going to completely change the the landscape there. So that's that's a really great. Awesome. Very good. Good deal. Thank you. Good Thank you, Mr. Foster. All right, moving on to item 7A, consider award of CSP 2010-02 internal connection, Hope Elementary School E-rate. All right, Mr. Rick Reeves. Good evening, President Hubert, members of the board and Dr. Knoll. Tonight we're requesting that the board considers approval of CSP number 20-10-02 internal connections for Hope Elementary School which is our E-rate project to Datavox Incorporated for an estimated expenditure of 400,000. Notifications of proposal pertaining to the purchase of internal connections for the construction of the Hope Elementary School Campus Technology Project were distributed to potential service providers by filing Form 70 through the Universal Services Administrative Company, also known as USAC, e-file system. The proposal was advertised on the CIC purchasing website and also two times in the courier. Under the CSP, the purchase of internal connections for the campus will consist of any combination of the following items. So there's wireless access points, routers, switches, racks for routers and switches, phones, uninterrupted power supply, and any cabling and cabling components related to the installation and operation of these devices. We had four vendors submit four qualifying bid responses. Uh, pricing for this project shall be effective upon board award through June 30th, 2022, and shall include all costs to complete services required. Under E-rate guidelines for E-rate eligible items, work may begin April 1st, 2021. These proposals were evaluated by members of the technology department and reviewed by the purchasing department. Best value offers are recommended for board approval and noted on our attached summary sheet. Funding will be provided in the capital projects fund and at this time we recommend your approval. Do I hear a motion? I move we approve as presented. Very good, we need a second? Second. We have a second, very good. Any questions? All right, seeing none, all those in favor? Yeah. Very good. Motion passes. Thank you, Mr. Foster. Reeves. Reeves. Mr. Reeves. Reeves. I got more hair. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Man. <laughs> Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. That's a big shot. And Mr. Foster, <laughs> not Mr. Reeves. <laughs> 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 really? He'd been thinking about that or something. <laughs> yeah. Not much more. <laughs> we didn't plan that either. Yeah. All right. Move to uh, be consider award of CSP. 201003 internal access telecommunication e-rate. Uh, once again, we're requesting that the board considers awarding CSP number 20-10-03 for internet access and telecommunications e-rate project to Wave Media Inc., also known as ICTX, for an estimated expenditure of $1.3 million. Notifications of proposals pertaining to the acquisition of internet access and telecommunication services for CIC were distributed to potential service providers by filing form 470 through USAC. Uh, their e-file system as well. The proposal was advertised on the CIC purchasing website and also twice in the courier. Under this CSP, services provided by these vendors will include broadband data transport over both dark and lit fiber op optic cable. The district received multiple responses. Pricing for this project shall be effective for three years beginning July 1st, 2021 through June 30th, 2024 with options for renewing annually for two additional years. Proposals were evaluated by members of our technology department and also reviewed by the purchasing department. These funds are provided in the capital projects fund and at this time we recommend your approval. Very good. We need a motion, please. So moved. I have a motion and a second. I second the motion. We have a motion and a second. Any questions? I have a Mr. question. Mr. Reeves. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. I, I was just, I didn't get to see a, a detailed scope of the work, but how far are they having to bring that line in to the new elementary school? Jerry, any idea on that Because this is really paying to have that, that trunk line, that fiber optic line brought into the school to be connected, right? Yeah, well, that's more towards the end, though. Are you asking for the, the line coming to Hope? I'm just, yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, it'd come up to 242. ICTX is right by there already. So. Okay. I think they're right on 242. They're doing a lot of development out there. So okay, okay. So, so we're a, just coming from 242 haul. to the school. Yeah, it's a very short haul for them. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none. All those in favor? Any opposed? Very good. Motion passes. Thank you, Thank you. Uh, Dr. Noll. We need to go into a recess. Yes, if you would. Yes. So okay. we will. We don't adjourn. We just go into a recess. A recess at yes. time is 714. Perfect. Thank you. All right. At this time, we will move into a public hearing. 
Uh, we'll ask our CFO, Mr. Darren Rice, to come forward as we have a public hearing to consider whether the district should pay a one-time retention incentive payments to our district staff. At the conclusion of uh, Mr. Rice's presentation, there'll be an opportunity for public comment. Uh, Mr. Rice, if you would. Thank you. Good evening, President Hubert, members of the board, Dr. Noll, and community members. It is my pleasure to present the proposed retention incentive payment. So what are we proposing? We're proposing an amendment to the 2020-2021 staff compensation plan and budget to provide for a one-time retention incentive payment for all employees. The retention payment will be paid to those employees who were hired by December 1st, 2020 and are still employed on January 15th, 2021. Since this is a retention payment, the district retains the right to deduct and recover the amount of, of the one-time retention incentive payment from any employee who does not complete the 2020-2021 school year. The one-time retention incentive payment will be paid on February 1st, 2021 for the following amounts. All full-time employees will receive a $500 check. Uh, full-time employees are classified as any employee with a work schedule greater than 50% and is eligible for the district's benefit contribution. Our part-time employees will receive a payment of $250, and they're classified as any employee with a work schedule of 49% and below. Payment will be made from the same funding source as the employee's annual salary, and the estimated cost of this payment is $4,050,000. So why are we proposing this stipend? It is undisputed that the response to COVID-19 and the prevention and mitigated mitigation strategies have required unforeseen and unprecedented additional responsibilities and duties for all staff to ensure a safe instructional environment while facilitating excellent learning opportunities for students. These responsibilities and duties are far above and beyond traditional levels. We're proposing a one-time retention incentive payment to address employee retention during the pandemic. So the public purpose of the payment is to ensure that the district is able to continue to retain employees so that the district can remain open to serve students during the pandemic. This public purpose meets the legal requirements for the district to amend the staff compensation plan and budget. And that concludes our public hearing. Thank you, Mr. Rice. Mm -hmm. This time we will open to public comment. Does anyone like to make a comment? You could come to the podium. Okay, seeing no movement or is there? I, I think that's well-deserved, and I think you really need to do that. Thank you, Stuart. Appreciate that. Who's Anyone that? else? Okay. That will conclude our hearing. Mr. Okay. Hubert, meeting is yours. Thank you very much. We'll call the meeting back in. Do we, do we need to call the meeting back in yes. at 717? Yes, sir. Very good. Moving to item 7D, uh, consider adoption of resolution to make one-time retention incentive payment. All right. Mr. Rice. Yes, we're recommending the Board of Trustees adopt a resolution authorizing the district to make a one-time retention, retention incentive payment to all eligible, eligible employees as presented in the public hearing. Uh, Full-time benefit eligible employees will receive a one-time $500 payment. Employees who work part-time will receive a one-time $250 payment. The cost of the one-time retention payment is $4,050,000. Four I recommend your approval. Do we have a motion? Mr. President, after public hearing and discussion, I move that the Conroe Independent School District Board approve a board resolution amending the 2020-2021 compensation plan and budget to approve a one-time retention incentive payment to all benefit-eligible full-time and part-time employees who return for the spring 2020-2021 semester as set forth in the board resolution. Such payment is being made for the public purpose of ensuring continued retention, high job satisfaction and productivity, and maintaining sound fiscal management and stability in times of unprecedented additional job duties. These funds, the funds for this payment shall come from the general fund. The payment will be distributed on February 1st, 2021, as further set forth in the resolution. Do we have a second? I have a second. We have a motion and a second. Do we have any discussion? I, yes. I don't have discussion. I just have a comment. Um, I have heard countless stories from both parents and from teachers uh, during this pandemic how everyone has been affected. And I am so grateful 
that we have teachers that have gone over, above, beyond, 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 beyond uh, in, in taking care of our students the way that Conroe ISD has done. And I wish we could do $5 million a person. I, I, I know that's crazy, but your, your value, this, this does not show all the value that, that you have. Um, and I just wanted to personally offer my personal thank you for every teacher, every bus driver, every maintenance, for everyone that is involved in our school district that touches the lives of our students, either directly or indirectly. It makes a huge impact. And I just want to say thank you. Well, thank, you. thank you for that. Any other, any other thoughts or, or questions? I think it's well said. Ditto. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it any better? Yeah. yeah, thank you for well, well said. Okay, so let's call this to a vote. All those in favor of the stipend of the motion, raise your hand. Any opposed? And it is with great honor to say the motion passes. Thank you very much. Thank you. If I, if I may speak on behalf of our employees, just to say thank you. We appreciate the um, this investment and in, in the recognition of the hard work. It's it's uh, it's truly been amazing to see what they've done. As we we spent, you know, the spring and the summer talking about uh, if we could if we could do what we plan to do, if we could really open school and keep school open. And uh, I think we have far exceeded our expectations and that's because of the, the great work of the staff. And so uh, from, from all of us, we say thank you to you all for your leadership. So thank you. you bet. Okay, moving to item E, consider approval of the amendment 2020-2020 on auxiliary uh, employee pay plan and substitute teacher pay. All right, Mr. Rice. Yes, tonight we're recommending the Board of Trustees approve the amended 2020-2021 Auxiliary Employee Pay Plan and Substitute Teacher Pay Scale. Both of these employee groups are critical to the district's ability to remain open during the pandemic. These recommended pay increases can be paid for within the current budget. For the custodians, they are key to maintaining the mitigation measures necessary to keep the district schools open during the pandemic. Currently, the district has over 50 unfilled custodian positions in addition to the custodians that are out on approved leaves. The unfilled positions account for over 1 million square feet of district facilities that are being cleaned by current custodians receiving overtime pay. The current starting pay for a custodian in the district is $10.85 per hour. Other districts in the fast food industry pay a minimum of $12.25 per hour. By increasing the hourly wage for level one, two and three custodians that are not in a supervisory position by $1.50 per hour. Starting pay in the district for these positions will be $12.35 per hour. This will allow the district to be competitive. And TASBO has agreed that the recommended <clears throat> increase is appropriate considering the current market conditions for these hard to fill positions. And then to maintain the integrity of the district's pay scales, it is also recommended that the hourly rate of level three custodians in a supervisory position and all custodians level four and above be increased by $1 per hour. This will bring the starting hourly rate for these positions to $16.25 per hour. For our substitutes, the substitute teacher job fill rate has been below 70% for most of the school year. The district believes that by increasing the daily pay rate, the district will be able to attract additional substitute teachers as a recommended increase will bring CISD in line with what other districts are paying. The recommendation is to increase the substitute teacher pay rate by $10 per day. The current CISD substitute teacher daily pay rate for short term assignments is for a degreed position is $85. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, yes. She's yeah. The schedule, I'm sorry. Uh, the current CISD substitute teacher daily pay rate for short term assignment is degreed is $85, degreed certified is $95 per day, and for long term assignments, degreed is $110 per day, and degreed certified is $120 per day. The proposed substitute teacher pay rate for short term assignments is degreed will be $95, degreed certified moved to $105 per day, and for long term assignments, degreed of $120, and degreed certified for $130 dollars per day. Both of these employee groups are in hard to fill positions and critical to the district's ability to remain open during the pandemic. These recommended pay increases can be paid for within the district's current budget. Uh, these changes will be effective in the pay period beginning January 3rd, 2021. And I, at this time I recommend your approval. 
Do we have a motion? Yeah. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Any questions or conversation? You know, I've got a couple quick questions. Um, yes, sir. So we are amending our, our budget for this, correct? For this, we're just amending the pay plan. Just amending the, the pay yes, plan. Sir. Okay. Yeah, we're, we're able to maintain both of these raise increases without having to amend the budget. All right, perfect. Thank you for that clarif clarification. All right, any other questions? Seeing none, all those in favor? Any opposed? Very good, motion passes. Thank, thank you very much. You. Once again, I'd just say thank you. Uh, it's significant, you know, our custodians are carrying a heavy load and because we are short handed right now, they're carrying even more and that's gonna make a difference. But. Uh, I think I can speak on behalf of all the teachers. I know I spoke uh, to our, to our uh, members that are here tonight. The substitute fill rate is significant for all staff because if we don't have a sub in a classroom, teachers are giving up their own time to, to go into that. So uh, although that $10 is directly paid to the substitute, that is also an investment in all of our teachers mm -hmm. uh, in the district. So we thank you for doing that. Very good. Thank you. Moving to item F, receive financial reports. Ms. Garza. Yes. Good evening, President Hubert, members of the board, and Dr. Knoll. <clears throat> it is my pleasure this evening to present the financial statements as of November 30th, 2020. The first statement we'll look at this evening is the balance sheet. The balance sheet shows the district's assets, liabilities, and fund balances. Presented here are for the general fund, the debt service fund, child nutrition, and self-funded insurance. In the general fund, we have total assets of 500 $68.7 million. In debt service, $121.5 million. Child nutrition, $4.4 million. And in self-funded insurance, $9.8 million. Taking a closer look at our cash and investments, total cash and investments in the general fund is at $203 million. The majority of that is made up of our um, state investment pools at 149.7, and the remainder um, in our TCG investment advisors at uh, $52.5 million. Next statement is our income statement. The income statement shows the district's revenues and expenditures. Our revenues come from three sources, local, state, and federal program revenues. Total expenditures in the general fund are at $88.5 million. In child nutrition, $2.9 million. Tax collection progress, I know we're early in the process. Um, Tax bills went out um, in October, so we're slowly starting to see collections come in. We are trending about a half a percent above where we were last year at this time. We will see the majority of our collections come in um, over the next few months. We just wanted to give you an update on that. 2019 bond referendum. We currently have $105.3 million encumbered to date, leaving a total of 531.1 remaining. We have sold to date $311.5 million. That does include the most recent bond sale that we closed on last month. Self-funded insurance for the year, total revenue of $13.3 million, total expense of 13.3, so we are just at break even for the year. November was a little bit better month for us. Um, participation at the wellness centers is averaging 357. Our investments as of November 30th, par value is at $547.4 million. <clears throat> our combined portfolio has a WAM of 44 days, yielding 0.294. Our longer-term investments with TCG have a WAM of 486, yielding 1.467. And our 90-day T-bill is at 0 0.088, which is our benchmark. All right. Very good. Thank you, Ms. Garza. Thank you. All right. Uh, we do not have executive session today, so... Entertaining a, a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. All right. Very good. Happy holidays. Merry Christmas. Everybody.